صبری مرا نام ربا نام ربای سای بور یا خط و ادو نام لحین و ملخ و ایلام بای ری پری اگفن بارا خط و ادو نام لحین و ملخ و ایلام عشقیشان به میتوای ساو برا تبانو به شب از کات شای و عبا برا تنین خیلان نو ویکو رای نام حسی به ریشید 25 years ago, Steven Spielberg Schindler's List was released in theaters. I've always wanted to know more about how this film was made, but it has never been released to home video with any in-depth making of documentaries. So this video is my effort to consolidate as much useful information as I could find about the making of Schindler's List. I read tons of books and news articles, and I even interviewed some of the filmmakers. You'll learn about the long road that it took to get Schindler's List to the big screen, what the actual production was like, and how the film was received. In October 1982, Thomas Keneally's novel Schindler's Ark was first published. In the United States, where the title was changed to Schindler's List, Steven Spielberg was given a copy of the book by his mentor, Sid Scheinberg, who was then the president of MCA Universal. Spielberg and Scheinberg immediately were interested in the prospects of turning Schindler's List into a film, and they invited Thomas Keneally over for a meeting. Accompanying Keneally to the meeting was Poldek Pfefferberg, the Holocaust survivor who had first told Keneally about the true story of Oskar Schindler and how he had saved the lives of over 1,200 Jews during World War II. At the meeting, Pfefferberg said, I tell you, Stephen, you make this film of humanity man to man, it will win you an Academy Award. Guaranteed. No doubt at all. You'll get an Oscar for Oscar. Universal officially bought the film rights for Spielberg in 1983. Please, when are you starting? Pfefferberg asked Spielberg, who replied, 10 years from now. Spielberg would turn out to be absolutely correct with that estimation. As part of his deal with Spielberg, Thomas Keneally was commissioned to write the first screenplay, and Keneally delivered a 220-page draft to Spielberg in mid-1983. But Spielberg told Keneally that he thought perhaps he was too close to the material, that he was too attached to incidents which did not contribute to the main plot, and that he should try to get the script's length down to fit a two-hour movie. In an apparent attempt to make the story more dramatic, Spielberg even contemplated a formula for the film in which a fictional SS character would try to corrupt Oscar Schindler. Spielberg allowed Keneally to write one more draft of the script, and by 1985, Keneally had gotten the length down, but Spielberg still wasn't satisfied with it, so he decided to try some other writers. Keneally says he was fine with this, since he was ready to move on anyway and go back to his career as a novelist. Spielberg hired out-of-Africa screenwriter Kurt Lutke to write a new draft of the script. But according to journalist Zoe Heller, Lutke spent the next four years struggling with the script, unable to write more than 30 pages of it. Spielberg later commented, I almost forgot about the whole thing in the meantime. Lukey couldn't find a way to shake the book down without the movie becoming nine hours long. I think he also had worries about his own German genteel extraction. After that, Spielberg asked Tom Stoppard to write the script, but Stoppard was too busy, and at some point during this period, Spielberg began losing confidence in his own abilities to direct Schindler's List. His previous efforts in the 1980s to bring the literary adaptations of The Color Purple and Empire of the Sun to the big screen had yielded mixed reactions from critics, allegedly convincing him that critics were not determined to give him a fair hearing as a serious director. He went back to directing the kinds of fantasy-based films he was best known for, and he started offering Schindler's List to other directors. He offered it to Roman Polanski, but Polanski turned it down because his own experiences as a Holocaust survivor were still too painful, and Polanski wasn't ready to make a movie about it just yet. At another point, Sidney Pollock inherited the project, according to journalist Ann Thompson. Kathleen Kennedy and Universal Chairman Tom Pollock then offered Schindler's List to Martin Scorsese, who signed on to the project in 1987, and Scorsese commissioned screenwriter Stephen Zalian to write a new draft of the script. Zalian reportedly turned in his draft of the script in 1989. In an interview with Bernard Weinraub, Zalian commented, I wanted to focus on Schindler and Schindler alone and imagine events almost entirely through his eyes. Zalian's script was 151 pages long, which meant that it would have to be at least a two and a half hour film or maybe even a three hour film. But in an interview with David Gritton, Spielberg recalled that Zalian had a very strong point of view. 
He approached it as the Rosebud Theory, the mystery as to why Schindler did what he did. Why would a German Catholic industrialist, a member of the National Socialist Party, a womanizer, a bon vivant, and cynic, sacrifice everything he was and all the money he ever made to save Jews? That became the story. But according to Martin Scorsese's biographer, Andy Dugan, after Scorsese read Zalian's script for Schindler's List, he reluctantly felt like he was coming in and taking Spielberg's pet project away from him. Spielberg read Zalian's script in bed one night while working on the film Hook, and the script made such an impression on him that he turned to his wife Kate Capshaw, who was half asleep, and told her, I'm doing Schindler's List as my next film. Spielberg had been set to direct a remake of Cape Fear for Universal, but instead he and Scorsese decided to swap projects. Scorsese was given Cape Fear, and Schindler's List was given back to Spielberg. Thomas Keneally asked Spielberg if he would consider changing the film's title to Schindler's Ark, which had always been Keneally's preferred title for the book, but Spielberg wanted the symbolism of lists all throughout the film. Thus, Schindler's List would have to remain the film's title. It seemed at first as though Schindler's List would indeed become Spielberg's next film after Hook, but Spielberg actually had another mammoth-sized project already in the works, Jurassic Park. Sid Sheinberg gave Spielberg the go-ahead to make Schindler's List, but with one condition, he had to make Jurassic Park first, because Sheinberg knew that once Spielberg had made a film as devastating as Schindler's List, he wouldn't have the heart to go through with making something as playful as Jurassic Park. Poldick Pfefferberg, of course, disapproved and said, Stop playing around with the dinosaurs, Stephen. I promise you, you'll get an Oscar for Oscar. Actually, there were cynics in Hollywood at the time who even suggested that Spielberg was only making Schindler's List to win an Oscar, an accusation which Spielberg vehemently denied, stating, I don't deal with that. It's not true. There's nothing self-serving about what motivated me to bring Schindler's List to the screen. I don't give any credibility to other people's cynicism. One of Spielberg's producers on Jurassic Park was Gerald R. Mullen, who had first been introduced to Spielberg by Kathleen Kennedy in the 1980s, and who first worked as a unit production manager for Spielberg before graduating to the role of producer. In February 1992, as Jurassic Park was being prepped, Spielberg told Mullen that they'd be making Schindler's List next. At first, Mullen said, okay, but then he was stunned when Spielberg said they'd be shooting Schindler's List immediately after Jurassic Park wrapped principal photography. Unsure if this was even possible, Mullen went home, thought about it, talked to his wife, then went back to the studio and told Spielberg, okay, let's shoot it. Spielberg was surprised by Mullen's confidence, and Mullen stated that the two films could be shot back to back as long as another producer was hired for Schindler's List. Kathleen Kennedy recommended Bronco Lustig, whom she had once interviewed about projects in Europe. Mullen met with Lustig for lunch in LA, where Lustig mentioned that he had read Thomas Keneally's book before. Then, Lustig showed Mullen a tattoo of numbers on his arm, revealing that he himself was a Holocaust survivor. Among Lustig's duties as producer would be making sure that the film was authentic, and according to Spielberg, it was Lustig who chose some of the best faces among the extras. Spielberg's original intention was to shoot the film in German and Polish with English subtitles. He later stated, I realized that I really didn't know the languages well enough to be able to tell if the actors were giving good performances or not. Plus, I didn't think people would sit through the subtitles. Also, in an interview with Susan Royal, he stated, I wanted people to watch the images, not read the subtitles. There's too much safety in reading. It would have been an excuse to take their eyes off the screen and watch something else. However, Spielberg had a big disagreement with Universal over his plans to shoot the film in black and white. Although Sid Sheinberg supported this idea, Universal chairman Tom Pollock asked Spielberg whether he had considered shooting the movie on color stock and printing it in black and white. Spielberg rejected this idea, partially because a few years earlier, Ted Turner had been colorizing classic black and white films, and Spielberg absolutely did not want this to ever happen with Schindler's List. Jerry Mullen backed up this argument by explaining that he thought there was nothing wrong with black and white, especially since he had grown up watching black and white movies. Tom Pollock now says that Spielberg was right. Spielberg claimed, Nobody at the studio really wanted me to make the movie at all. One studio executive who shall remain nameless said, Why don't we just make a donation to the Holocaust Museum? Would that make you happy? I blew up when I heard that. 
Knowing that the film, budgeted at $23 million, was commercially risky for the studio and not wanting to take what he referred to as blood money for his work, Spielberg elected not to take a salary for his direction and to give up his percentage of the film's profits, which instead would be donated to Jewish organizations, to the United States Holocaust Museum, and to Spielberg's own non-profit, Survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation. For the role of Oscar Schindler, Spielberg initially tried to find an actor who physically resembled Schindler. He commented that had he made the film in the 1960s, somebody like Gert Frobe would have looked the part. Then in 1992, Spielberg went to see a New York production of Anna Christie in which actor Liam Neeson was performing. Backstage, Neeson was so delighted to see Spielberg and his family visiting him that he embraced Kate Capshaw's mother and kissed her on both cheeks. Spielberg was impressed by this gesture because Neeson displayed the same gentlemanly ease with women which Oscar Schindler was famously known for. Spielberg cast Neeson in the part and helped him get into character by showing him home videos of the late Time Warner chairman Steve Ross, to whom the film was eventually dedicated. Stephen wanted me to put on weight. His office gave me protein powders that I tried to take. I was throwing up, but I couldn't take it. However, pints of Guinness in Poland did work. Thanks. <laughs> There's a company you did the books for on Lipovic Street. Made what? Pots and pens? By law, I have to tell you, sir, I'm a Jew. Well, I'm a German, so there we are. Academy Award winner Ben Kingsley was cast in the role of Schindler's Jewish accountant, Itzhak Stern. There really was a man named Itzhak Stern, but the character in the film is actually a composite of three men who worked for Oscar Schindler. Itzhak Stern, Abraham Bankier, and Miatek Pemper. Let me understand. They put up all the money, I do all the work. What if you don't mind my asking, what do you do? I'd make sure it's known the company's in business. I'd see that it had a certain panache. That's what I'm good at, not the work, not the work. The presentation. For the role of Plazow Nazi Commandant Amon Gert, Spielberg decided to cast up-and-coming actor Ray Fiennes after seeing his performances in a British production of Wuthering Heights and in the TV movie A Dangerous Man. Producer Gerald Mullen was initially confused by the casting choice, particularly after looking at clips of Fiennes' performance in an old 1985 production of Midsummer Night's Dream, but Mullen changed his mind after seeing Fiennes dress convincingly in Nazi uniform with a chilling look in his eyes. Survivor Niusia Karakolska had known the real Amon Gert, and when Niusia first met Ray Fiennes, she told him details about what Gert was like, but then suddenly she became so disturbed by Fiennes' similarities to Gert that after she said goodbye to Fiennes, she backed away from him on trembling legs. Fiennes immediately felt bad about having this effect on her, and he tried to tell her that he was only an actor. For six centuries, there has been a Jewish cracker. Think about that. By this evening, those six centuries are a rumor. They never happened. Today is history.
To get a better sense of who exactly Amon Gert was, he read Tom Segev's book Soldiers of Evil, which contained six helpful pages of biography about Gert's life, and how Gert's detachment from his more intellectual parents drove him into the Nazi party, which better appreciated his physical strength and athletic ability and served as an outlet for his more sadistic urges. Spielberg arrived in Poland to initiate Schindler's List on the morning of February 24th, 1993. The first scene was to be of ghetto inhabitants shoveling snow. Yet when the crew got to Poland, there was no snow, so Gerald Mullen spoke to the Polish army about bringing in snow trucks for the scene. But overnight, on March 1st, the first day of filming, a blizzard occurred, and the snow trucks were no longer needed. I just, I'm just wondering, is, 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 is the synagogue a good background, or is the park a good background? This is kind of interesting. Stephen said, I feel like I'm directing my first movie. I'm not storyboarding anything. And I think I gave him an adrenaline or something that we all felt. The fire, an alertness. I've never felt the same level of energy and focus. Days later, when it was time to shoot the springtime scenes, Spielberg asked Mullen how they were going to get rid of all the snow because there was so much of it everywhere, so Mullen began devising plans to have the snow washed away. But then, Mullen woke up one morning and opened the curtains on his window, only to find that the snow had already melted all by its own, thus allowing them to film the springtime scenes. Eventually, Spielberg wanted to go back and film the boxcar sequences, which would require snow. But lo and behold, once again, it naturally started snowing again on the set. Because of amazing experiences like this, Gerald Mullen now believes that a higher power was watching over the production of Schindler's List. On most other movies, things are constantly going wrong on the set, but not on this movie. The director of photography on Schindler's List was the young Polish cinematographer Janusz Kaminski, whom Spielberg hired because of his fluency in the Polish language and because of his experience working at a fast pace on the Amblin TV movie Class of 61. Some of the handheld footage in Schindler's List would also be shot by Spielberg himself. Now, I have an idea. How about just lying in their mouths, nothing else? I was just going, you know what? Isn't wonderful? Him? I wanna, no, him? I want to lie just from the top. Uh, you know, so we got some shadows here, just like... Okay. I just want to make sure we're not being too um, on the nose with the, you know, the badness of the character by having a straight down light. Everything we do in this medium is about light and shadow. It's how the cinematographer lights the actors, lights the set. If you look at Schindler's List, Amon Gert was always lit beautifully. He always had a beautiful front light. Now the guy he was very clear, there was no mystery in him. You don't have to enhance his evilness, if you may say, by lighting. Now if you look at Oscar Schindler, that was a confused individual. He came to Poland, make money. So it's always glamorous, but always shadowy. And then as the movie's progressing, he gets more frontal light. The shadows disappear. Liam Neeson admitted to documentarian Susan Lacey that he didn't enjoy being directed by Spielberg on how to smoke cigarettes in the film's opening scene in the Nazi nightclub, recalling, I was a smoker at the time. Stephen's not a smoker, but in the close-ups, he would start to tell me how to smoke. He'd say, okay, uh, you're looking at the table, you see three of these high-ranking Nazi guys, take a drag of your cigarette. No, no, do it again. Keep your fingers out. Take a drag, let the smoke curl up your face. Do it again. Okay, and I take your hand away very, very slowly. So he was basically telling me how to breathe. And I remember sharing it with Ben Kingsley later on that night or the next day. I said, Ben, I just, if every scene's gonna be like that, I'm, I'm a fucking puppet, you know? I don't wanna be a puppet. I'm 41 years of age. And I remember Ben so well, he said, a great conductor needs a good soloist. So just trust that. Just go into his direction. Don't fight against it. Just go into it. And that's what I did. I just opened myself for Stephen, you know? What's surprising is that decades later, in a 60 Minutes interview with Anderson Cooper, Neeson claimed that he wasn't satisfied with his Shinner's List performance, stating, I thought the film was quite extraordinary except for myself. 
I didn't own the part. I didn't see enough of me in there. The central mystery of Schindler's List is, why did Oscar Schindler, a businessman so entrenched in the Nazi underworld, risk everything to save the lives of his workers? After the war, the real Oscar Schindler claimed, But the film wisely never answers these questions in the same simplistic manner. The film remains true to what has long been described by historians as Schindler's ambiguity. No one really knows for sure why Schindler did what he did, and in the end, it doesn't really matter, because what matters more is that he did the right thing. Spielberg's decision to make Schindler's motivations ambiguous didn't sit well with Universal, and he stated, The studio, of course, wanted me to spell everything out. I got into a lot of arguments with people saying we need that big Hollywood catharsis where Schindler falls to his knees and says, Yes, I know what I'm doing. Now I must do it, and goes full steam ahead. That was the last thing I wanted. I'm not sure he really felt that during the war. It was a lot easier for him to define his own actions after he had taken them. I also felt that it would have been too melodramatic of me to have invented a reason for him. It would have been too easy for the sort of couch potato tastes of American audiences who demand easy answers to complicated questions. I felt it would have been a disservice to Schindler's deeds to have manufactured something just because I couldn't find it in real life. The list is an absolute good. The list is life. All around. Its margins lies the cuff. The single moment in the film which subtly suggests a change in Schindler's attitude from insensitive businessman to a concerned humanitarian occurs during the sequence where he witnesses the liquidation of the Krakow ghetto. The most famous part of this sequence is the appearance of a little girl in a red coat named Genia in the novel who walks through the atrocities and who is based on a real little girl whom Schindler really did see. To quote from the novel, Oscar had seen in Kakusa Street a statement of his government's policy which could not be written off as a temporary aberration. The SS men were, Oscar believed, fulfilling there the orders of the leader, for otherwise their colleague at the rear of the column would not have let a child watch. Later in the day, after he had absorbed a ration of brandy, Oscar understood the proposition in its clearest terms. They permitted witnesses, such as the Red Toddler, because they believed the witnesses would all perish too. Also, as Spielberg himself explained to film critic Richard Schickel, I did it in color, or at least I did the coat in color, for another reason, which was that the Holocaust was known about. You had Ben Hecht and Roosevelt and Eisenhower, and Churchill knew that the Holocaust was taking place. It was as obvious as a little girl wearing a red coat walking down the street. But I thought that if there was any turning point at all, it was his observation of the liquidation of the Krakow ghetto from horseback. Spielberg warned Olivia Dabrowska, the three-year-old girl playing Genia, not to watch Schindler's List until she turned 18. She later admitted to the Times that she broke that promise, watched the movie when she was 11, and was so traumatized by its violence that it took her until she was 18 to come to terms with it. By then, she said, I realized I had been part of something I could be proud of. Spielberg was right. I had to grow up to watch the film. Played over the sequence is the haunting Yiddish song Ofen Pripashik. The version used was originally arranged by composer Mark Isham for the movie Billy Bathgate. I assume Spielberg had initially used it only as a temp track for the crack of liquidation sequence, but that he ended up liking it so much that he bought the rights to it and kept it in the film. We took on the mantle of actor warriors, if you like. Because if you soften anything with sentiment, you lessen the blow that the audience have got to feel and got to reel under. In the liquidation of the ghetto scene, I knew I had to serve the story. I remember my lines, but I was in deep shock. No acting. The beautifully orchestrated chaos was uh, unrepeatable and unforgettable. When Paul Dick Pfefferberg visited the set of Schindler's List, he was astounded by the production's realism. 
In the film, he's played by Israeli actor Jonathan Segal, to whom Pfefferberg said, Jonathan, I love you. You're a good-looking guy, but you're nowhere near as good-looking as I was at your age. However, Pfefferberg was embarrassed by a fictional scene in the film in which he's shown to be black marketeering inside the Church of the Virgin Mary, and he assured the filmmakers, you know, I would never black marketeer in that beautiful church. The scene where Amon Gert tries and fails to execute the Rabbi Levertov, played by Ezra Dagan, with not just one, but two guns, is all the more astounding when you realize that the incident actually occurred in real life. Recalling the making of the sequence, Ezra Dagan stated, I remember the barrel of a gun at my neck. I was trembling for real. We shot that scene six times, and after each take, I wanted to hug Ray Fiennes as if to say, we are only playing. You wanted to avoid cliches about Nazis. And in terms of performance, I understood it on my first day. You know, the thing about Armand having a cough, and <clears throat> excuse me, and giving him sort of banal human failings, touches like that. Do you have any questions, sir? Yeah, well, it's top down. I'm fucking freezing. There are ways in which through performance and filming you can amp up and signal bad guy. And I think he wanted, quite rightly, to say, no, man doing job you decide what you think. In an otherwise positive essay on the movie, Roger Ebert suggested that Amon Gert was too one-dimensional of a character in the film, but I don't agree with this criticism at all. I would argue that Amon Gert is a complex character. Yes, he's a madman. Yes, he loves to kill. But Spielberg tries whenever possible to show the glimmers of humanity concealed beneath Gert's Nazi facade. I would like so much to reach out and Touch you in your loneliness. What, 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 that, what would that be like, I wonder? I mean, <laughs> what would be wrong with that? Gert's infatuation with his maid, Helen Hirsch, played by Emmeth Davids, is complicated by his awareness that she is a Jew and he's supposed to hate Jews. Because of this, he tries to resist his feelings for her by abusing her and very nearly murdering her. <laughs> But by the end of the film, he desires her so much that he admits he would sooner deliver her a mercy killing before letting her be whisked off to the gas chambers, and that he would even sooner wish for her to go back to Vienna with him after the war ends. I can't wear your head in an account again. Why not? Wouldn't be right. She's just going to Auschwitz number two anyway. What difference does it make? She's not going to Auschwitz. I'd never do that to her. No, I want her to um, come back to Vienna with me. I want her to come... Come and work for me there. I want to uh, grow old with her. Are you mad? Come on. You can't take her to Vienna with you. No, of course I can't. It's what I'd like to do. What I can do if I'm any sort of a man is the next most merciful thing. I should take her into the woods and shoot her painlessly in the back of the head. Gert also does at least one decent thing in the film, and that is to use his influence to free Oskar Schindler from jail after Schindler is arrested by the Nazis for kissing a Jewish woman. He likes good-looking women. He sees a beautiful woman he doesn't think. <laughs> he has so many women. <laughs> they love him. <laughs> Yeah, they, they love him. I mean, he's married, yeah, but he's... <laughs> no, all right, you know. She was Jewish. She shouldn't have done it. But you didn't see this girl. I saw this girl, and this girl was... Oh, <laughs> she was very good looking. They cast a spell on you, you know, the Jews. When you work closely with them, like I do, you see this. They have this power. It's like a virus. Some of my men are infected with this virus. They should be pitied, not punished. They should receive treatment, because this is as real as typhus. I see this all the time. It's a matter of money. Hmm? You're offering me a bribe? A bribe? No. No, please. It's a gratuity. Gert likes Schindler. He sees him as a friend. He trusts him confides in him, and, ironically, by having him freed from jail, he unknowingly clears the way for Schindler to finish rescuing his Jewish factory workers. Look, all you have to do is tell me what it's worth to you. What's a person worth to no, you? No, 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 no. What's one worth to you? 
On behalf of the, of the workers, sir, I, I wish for you a happy birthday. Happy birthday? Well, well, Mr. please. Thank you very much for the lovely cake. <clears throat> The little girl kissed by Schindler on his birthday was Niusia Karakolska, played in the film by Agnieszka Makuzuska. When the real Niusia met the little girl who was playing her in the film, Niusia was both confused and moved by the surrealism of the moment. She actually had to leave the set after the first take because the recreation of this memory from her childhood was simply too distressing for her. Spielberg immediately went over to comfort her, as did Liam Neeson, who kissed her on both cheeks, just as Oscar Schindler himself once did years ago. Niusia was also the one who told Spielberg about how some Jews would swallow diamonds in order to hide them from the Nazis, and Spielberg liked this detail so much that he included it in the film. Sometimes the production of Schindler's List was dogged by threats of anti-Semitism from outsiders. You were in the thing because you took down a a, a anti-Semitic German businessman at the Hotel Forum. Uh, it yeah. was you took him right to the ground. Michael, it was Michael Schneider. He threatened Michael Schneider. He he walked across the bar with total impunity and asked Michael, who was sitting on a bar stool, relaxing after a hard day's filming, "Are you a Jew?" And Michael. In shock, said yes, and he mined a noose around his neck, the Sudetenland German hole, and, and pulled it tight. And I stood up. You did more than stand up. <laughs> On one day of shooting, a woman approached Ray Fiennes while he was in uniform, and she said how much she loved his uniform and that she wished the Nazis were still around for protection. Other times, swastikas were painted overnight to threaten the crew. Spielberg admitted that he had difficulty talking to the German actors who played the Nazis. Many of the German actors who interviewed for Schindler's List, and I saw many of their interviews on tape, many of them actually, knowing I was watching the tape, or would be watching the tape, apologized uh, for the generation preceding theirs, um, um, and talked about their guilt, and talked about their feelings, and very openly. I was so surprised at how many German actors would actually look at the camera, into the video camera, and talked to me 6,000 miles away. It was, it was sort of a fascinating experience. When I got there and be, I began to, to work on Schindler's List, once those same German actors put on the uniforms of the Waffen-SS, um, um, my attitude changed and I couldn't talk to them. I couldn't, and, and between shots they would be schmoozing with me, trying to ask me questions about E.T. and Raiders of the Lost Ark, questions that someone who liked those movies would ask the director. And I didn't really want to make small talk. I, I couldn't get past the uniform. And then my prejudice began to come out. And I began to look at it. And I began to say, my goodness, you know, um, how could I be blaming, you know, the sins of the fathers onto the sons and daughters? Why, why, why do I feel this way? And, I, and yet I, was, I felt anger when I saw the uniform. And I knew there was a German in that uniform. I felt anger. And then one day, an amazing thing, thing happened very early in the schedule, thank goodness. We had Passover. And we went to the, to, the, to the hotel forum for the Seder. There was a rabbi there, and a lot of my crew and cast came in. And then in walks all the German actors, and they put on yarmulkes. They sat next to the Israeli actors, and the Israelis opened up the Haggadahs, the prayer books, and began to show the German actors what Passover is all about. And I, 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 and I cried, and I cried because um, I saw something beautiful that was essentially an entire generation of young German actors that are not culpable and should never be blamed and should never have any fingers pointed at them for something that they weren't around to stop. I remember I put together a scene, very hard to motion him. And Stephen comes in that night, we went out to where he was staying. And I start running the scene and he looks at it Hold on, I, I, I can't do it. He's like, he went like, I, I can't do it. it, it it's too tough, and, and he left. I just remember getting home and just falling apart, and, and Kate was on the set with me a lot. And we would cry together many, many times. She really kept me going through that whole production. We were four months in Krakow, a long time. The production took such a rough mental toll on Spielberg that he'd watched episodes of Seinfeld to help brighten his mood. Once a week, Robin Williams would call him on schedule and do 15 minutes of stand-up on the phone. 
Instead of saying goodbye, he'd always hang up on Spielberg on the loudest, best laugh he'd give him. Spielberg had to attend to the post-production duties on Jurassic Park at the same time that Schindler's List was being filmed. At least two or three times a week, he'd have to get on a crude satellite feed to Northern California to be able to approve T-Rex shots. It built a tremendous amount of resentment and anger in him to actually have to go from brutal holocaust sequences to more playful scenes of dinosaurs chasing jeeps. Spielberg recalled that one of the worst days of shooting was the filming of the health action sequence in which the Jews are forced to remove their clothes and run around the camp. Spielberg said it was only done a couple of times, but the actors had to be undressed for a number of hours, and Spielberg found himself having to turn his eyes away from them while shooting. No one can forget the harrowing moment in this sequence when young Ulrich Rosner, played by Camille Kraliak, flees from the Nazis by hiding in a latrine. This incident really happened in real life to a boy named Yannick Spira. The most difficult day of shooting was the filming of the sequence set inside Auschwitz-Birkenau where Schindler's female Jews are hurled into a shower, unsure if the shower heads will spray out water or gas. <laughs> Israeli actress Miri Fabian had actually been born in a concentration camp, and during filming of this sequence, she had trouble breathing, then began hyperventilating and was barely able to finish. Filmmaker Michael Haneke has criticized this sequence because he believes that it's too manipulative, but I would argue that the sequence is necessary because it's truthful. It's important to remember that Schindler's women really were accidentally shipped off to Auschwitz in real life. They didn't know if there would be water or gas in those showers. In fact, Schindler's women were trapped at Auschwitz for three weeks, so imagine how many fearful showers they would have been forced to have taken during that extended period, never knowing if they were going to live or die each time. The sequence in the film terrifyingly makes the audience feel the fear which these women felt. And in my opinion, this sequence could not have been filmed in any other effective way. The only other alternative would have been not to show it at all, and that's not interesting. This really happened, and it's something we need to see. They put us in the shower room, and are standing there quite some time till we are no but it's going to come down, or it's going to come down water, or it's going to come down gas. Are we going to get killed? Are we going to get gassed? We didn't know. That was the most horrible minutes. I don't know how long it was. For me, it, it was very, very long, but it probably wasn't long. But it, every minute was a year. And then came water, it came water. Spielberg initially wanted to shoot the film's Auschwitz-Birkenau sequences on location at the real Auschwitz death camp, and he got an initial approval from the World Jewish Congress. But the proposal was fought against by Kalman Soltanik, one of the Congress's vice presidents, as well as Henrik Halkowski, president of the Jewish Cultural Association in Krakow. They feared that a Hollywood production would treat the location insensitively, and Halkowski went so far as to sneer, nobody wants a Hollywood holocaust. Branko Lustig, himself a survivor of Auschwitz, was deeply offended at having his and Spielberg's intentions questioned. But then the International Council of the State Museum in Auschwitz also joined in opposition. Spielberg, Lustig, and Jerry Mullen went to New York to argue their case, but the appeal didn't work. Spielberg still wanted to shoot the film's train exteriors at Birkenau, so he asked Jerry Mullen if they could recreate the barracks on the left side of Birkenau, then have the train back into the real Birkenau, light it, and reverse the shot in editing. One person who loudly attacked Spielberg for shooting there was filmmaker Jean-Luc Godard, who later moaned about his failure to quote-unquote prevent Mr. Spielberg from reconstructing Auschwitz, although it deserves to be noted that Godard has been accused of anti-Semitism in many quarters. When Spielberg paid his first visit to Auschwitz, he said that he went expecting to cry buckets, and I didn't cry at all. I was outraged. I was furious. It was a reaction I didn't anticipate. When Liam Neeson got to the Auschwitz set, he was nervous and complained about the cold weather. Then Bronco Lucid came up to Neeson, showed him his arm tattoo, and reminded him that he and all the other real Holocaust victims at Auschwitz had been through way worse. Bronco Lustig comes up to me, I'm looking at the, the real huts of Auschwitz, and Bronco comes up to me and he points out one of the huts and said, see that hut there? Yeah, that was the hut I was in. And 
hit me. Big fucking time. Boy. Big time. Sorry. So I did my little scene, and my knees were literally shaking, you know? And uh, I kept saying the, the, the line wrong. I need this child to polish the inside of shell metal casings. It should have been metal shell casings. But anyway, that's... that's yes, 45 millimeter. Their fingers polish the insides of shell metal casings. How else am I to polish the inside of a 45 millimeter shell casing? You tell me. You tell me! Back on the train! Back on the train! One moment in the film which did not occur in real life was the climactic scene in which Schindler tearfully wishes that he had rescued more Jews. Thomas Keneally has pointed out that in reality, Schindler's factory had reached full capacity and there wasn't room for any more workers. But Spielberg's biographer, Joseph McBride, argues that the purpose of the scene is to remind the audience that however many people Schindler managed to save, there were millions more who died in the Holocaust, so any celebration of survival must be seen in the shadow of overwhelming loss. <laughs> Filmmaker Terry Gilliam has condescendingly dismissed Schindler's List as a movie about success instead of failure. Honestly, though, I wonder if Gilliam has even watched Schindler's List in its entirety, since it's clear that by making such reckless statements, he's ignoring not only Schindler's speech at the end of the film, but also an earlier scene where Schindler's women see lines of other Jews descending down into the gas chambers at Auschwitz as smoke billows overhead. Spielberg's friend, filmmaker Stanley Kubrick, allegedly once told writer Frederick Raphael that Schindler's List was a story about survival, and not about the full extent of the atrocities of the Holocaust. But I think the reason why Kubrick said this is just because Kubrick had once prepared his own movie about Holocaust survivors, a project entitled Aryan Papers, only to then abandon the project because Terry Semmel and Stanley decided to postpone it because of Schindler's List. That was finally his, his way out. Oh, well, it's coming too late. You know, you can't make two in a row. But Schindler's List was a story about somebody who saved a handful of Jews, not about the actual killings. And as he developed this film, it became clear to him he just couldn't do it. He had absorbed all this information, and at some point, he just imploded on knowing this 
he very much felt that if you show the total truth, how would you get an actor to do that? How would you get an audience to see that? You just can't do it. And at that point, you're not a filmmaker anymore. You, you're a contributor to the ultimate crime of all the torture stories in the world. So, in a way, he was unhappy, but he was happy that that was his official remark about stopping that film. Three quarters into production on Schindler's List, Spielberg started waking up in the middle of the night, fearing that audiences might not believe that the film was based on a true story, because Spielberg tended to be perceived as a director of fictional films. Then Spielberg came up with the idea to bring out as many of the real Schindler Juden as possible, and have them put stones around Schindler's grave in Mount Zion. It was also Spielberg's way of finding validation from the survivor community itself. The music used by Spielberg over this sequence was a version of the song Yerushalam Shel Zahav that was originally arranged by Philip Sard for the film Poor Sasha. In the scene where the line of Schindler Yudin walked towards the camera, the blocking initially got messy and convoluted, so Spielberg straightened out the shot by placing the Schindler Yudin in shorter lines. One of the Schindler Yudin who placed stones on Schindler's grave was Rizard Horowitz, who had survived Auschwitz at the age of five and who was interviewed about his experiences in John Blair's 1983 documentary, Schindler, The Real Story. I was the youngest person, or one of the youngest person who uh, uh, owes his life to, you know, to uh, Schindler's maneuvers. <laughs> I, you know, uh, looking at it in, you know, in perspective and, and uh, um, sort of recollecting it as, as an adult, uh, uh, there's no question that uh, I feel certain uh, homage to, you know, to, to the man, uh, whoever he was and however he did it. I mean, who cares, you know? <laughs> Life is really what, what counts. Spielberg invited Horowitz and his family to Jerusalem to be in the film's final scene, and he immediately recognized Horowitz from the Schindler documentary. Spielberg had shot a scene in which Horowitz and his cousin, Olek Rosner, are recognized by their mothers as the women are already boarding the train and leaving the camp, but the scene was cut out. In the film, Horowitz is briefly portrayed by Michael Babiars, but Babiars couldn't be present during the filming of the final scene because he'd been poisoned by gas escaping from a water heater at home while taking a bath, so Horowitz had to be in the scene alone without the actor portraying him. Horowitz did not actually get to meet Bob Yars until a decade after the film's release. Another person who made a cameo appearance during this sequence was Oscar Schindler's widow, Emily Schindler. In the film, Emily is portrayed by actress Caroline Goodall, and although there are scenes which hint at her efforts to help Oscar rescue the Jews, the full extent of Emily's achievements isn't quite explored in the film. On this matter, Spielberg explained, that's a whole other story worthy of a film. Emily Schindler made amazing contributions, especially in the medical area. I'd actually shot more scenes that involved Emily, but it didn't play into the central theme of Oscar Schindler. A minor controversy erupted when one of Emily Schindler's associates, Erica Rosenberg, began claiming to the press that Emily Schindler had not been paid by the filmmakers. This accusation was disputed by Spielberg and by Thomas Keneally, both of whom declared that they had, indeed, sent money to Emily Schindler, but Jean-Luc Godard seized on these accusations in his 2002 film In Praise of Love, perpetuating a gross rumor that Emily Schindler was never paid and was left to live in poverty in Argentina. However, film critics Charles Taylor and Roger Ebert struck back against Godard, pointing out that he was actually the one exploiting Emily Schindler. Thomas Keneally has speculated that Emily Schindler might just have been bitter that her late husband was suddenly being lionized as a hero all over the world, even though he had been an unfaithful husband to her and, worse, had abandoned her after the war ended. This, apparently, was the chief treachery of her life, and Keneally believes that for Emily to hear Oscar praised as heroic when he had failed to rescue her from the ignominy of being a dumped wife was for her still the main issue, the unresolved wound of Schindler's history. That had us angefangen, that er nicht mehr der Mann gewesen ist, was er vorher gewesen ist. Er hat nicht mehr die Willenskraft, er hat sie gehen lassen. Er hat nicht mehr den Willen aufgebracht, gegen dieses Schicksal zu kämpfen. Er hat sich schwimmen lassen, er hat nichts mehr angefangen. Das war das Ganze, die Hauptsache. Er hat gelebt, es wird schon etwas kommen. Er hat gelebt, wie die Argentinier manchmal leben. 
Was geht mich morgen an, heute sind wir da. In 1958, Schindler abandoned his wife and returned to Germany. In fact, when Emily Schindler made her appearance in the film, it was a documentation of her very first visit to the cemetery. She had never been to Oscar's grave before. Schindler's List wrapped production in May 1993, on schedule and under budget. Spielberg hired longtime collaborator John Williams to compose the musical score, enhanced with violin solos by Itzhak Perlman. Williams recalled in an interview with The Guardian that he was so moved by the rough cut of Schindler's List that he could barely speak. He remarked, Stephen, you need a better composer than I am to do this film. Spielberg replied, I know, but they're all dead. After post-production wrapped, Universal decided to start out by releasing the film on only 29 screens throughout the United States. Poldick Pfefferberg, of course, wasn't happy with this news, but Sid Scheinberg explained to him that Holocaust films were tough to sell and the studio was going to have to get good word of mouth going on Schindler's List in order to convince people to leave their homes and go see it. Tom Pollock commented, I feel like Sam Goldwyn who said, this is such an important film. I don't care if we ever make any money so long as every man, woman, and child in the country sees it. The film's word of mouth campaign got a big boost when Schindler's List premiered in Washington, D.C. on November 30th, 1993. President Bill Clinton was in attendance and the next day he urged the public to see the film. Last night I went to see Schindler's List. We had a special showing of it for the Holocaust Museum. And it's not going to be a highly advertised movie, and it's coming out around Christmas time. It'll be tough for people to see then. I implore every one of you to go see it. You will see portrait after portrait after portrait of the painful difference between people who have no hope and have no rage left and people who still have hope and still have rage. Schindler's List was released in theaters in the United States on December 15, 1993. It went on to gross $96 million domestically and $321 million worldwide. It received scores of praise from critics, audiences, and some of Spielberg's best-known peers in the film industry. Filmmaker Billy Wilder, who had once expressed interest in directing the film himself, sent a letter to Spielberg which read, They couldn't have gotten a better man. The movie is absolutely perfection. There was, however, some nasty criticism from others in the film industry. Screenwriter David Mamet accused Schindler's List of being exploitation because he didn't like the idea of the Holocaust being portrayed on screen. But Mamet's arguments were based on his own strange interpretations of the Jewish teachings of the Talmud. He argued that the only correct response to the Holocaust was silence. And to me, this kind of argument is dangerous because it encourages historical amnesia and, worse, Holocaust denial. Spielberg was particularly upset by criticisms from filmmaker Claude Landsman, whose nine-hour documentary Shoah had heavily influenced Spielberg, particularly, I'm assuming, during the scene in Schindler's List where a boy outside a train mocks the Jews on board, drawing a finger across his throat, which recalls a similar story told by survivor Richard Glazar in Shoah. Claude Landsman, however, failed to take note of this and wrote a painful essay in which he claimed not only that he saw no influence of Shoah in Schindler's List, but in which he also argued that the Holocaust should only be reserved as a subject for documentaries, not for dramatic films. Spielberg responded to Landsman by stating, I tell survivors to take their children's camcorders and set them up and do their own testimonies. That's one of the things that helped inspire me to organize survivors of the Shoah. Yet after I made Schindler's List, I was attacked by the maker of the documentary Shoah, Claude Landsman, who felt he should be the only voice in the definitive document of the Holocaust. It amazed me that there could be any hurt feelings in an effort to reflect the truth. Spielberg and Landsman did, however, have a reconciliation of sorts decades later. In an interview with The Hollywood Reporter, Landsman recalled that Spielberg had sent him a letter stating, You are my hero. You are my inspiration. You are my muse, and you are my friend. Schindler's List was nominated for 12 Academy Awards. Liam Neeson and Ray Fiennes were both nominated, but unfortunately did not win. Yet the film managed to take home seven Academy Awards. 
Best Art Decoration Set Decoration for Alan Starsky and Iwa Braun, whose speech abruptly got cut off by the orchestra. Best Music Original Score, John Williams. Best Cinematography, Janis Kaminsky. Best Film Editing, Michael Kahn. Best Adapted Screenplay, Steven Zalian. And of course, Best Director for Steven Spielberg. To the six million who, who can't be watching this among the one billion watching this telecast tonight. Thank you. And Best Picture for Spielberg, Gerald Mullen, and Bronco Lustig. To my wife, Pat, for sharing the magic for the past 40 years. And to Steven Spielberg for your courage and dedication to purpose that has given each and every one of us such a special and marvelous gift. My number was A3317. I am a Holocaust survivor. It's a long way from Auschwitz to this stage. I want to thank everyone who helped me to come so far. People died in front of me on the camps. The last words were, be a witness of my murder. Tell to the world how I died. Remember, together with Jerry, by helping Steven to make this movie, I hope I fulfill my obligation to the innocent victims of the Holocaust. In the name of the six million Jews killed in the Shoah and other Nazi victims, I want to thank everyone who acknowledged this movie. Thank you. Gerald Mullen recalls that winning an Academy Award was thrilling for someone like him, who had once been a kid growing up across the street from Republic Pictures, knowing always that he would someday make movies. It is, he says, a beautiful story of the American dream. And what better film to win an Academy Award for than a film like Schindler's List, which celebrates the enduring principle that one human being can, indeed, make a difference? As Steven Spielberg entered the governor's ball after the awards ended, Poldick Pfefferberg approached him, grabbed one of the awards in Spielberg's hands, and demanded, What did I tell you? What did I tell you? An Oscar for Oscar. Thanks for watching.